has not worked out a strategy on to deal with China. Just ask yourself a very simple question. Before you work out a strategy, you got to work out your strategic goals. And you ask yourself a simple question. What are the goals that the Trump administration was trying to accomplish with China? And what are the goals that the Biden administration is trying to accomplish with China? And the answer is zero. You can't, there's no answer. There's no clear answer. And I give you, I mean, hypothetically could be, I'll give you the following, okay? Number one, United States may be trying to stop China from becoming the number one economy in the world. Is that the goal? If that's the goal, it's going to fail. Definitely fail. Because nothing can stop the return of China. Nothing can, can, we, can we have no moral right to deprive the Chinese people of their right to improve their standard of living, improve their quality of life. And if they improve their standard, improve their quality of life, they will get a bigger economy. Their per capita income will go up, right? So is that what the United States is trying to do? Stop China's economy from becoming number one? And you know, by the way, Joe Biden said something very revealing in passing. He said, China wants to be number one. It ain't gonna happen on my watch. He's right. <laughs> if Joe Biden is only president for four years, it will not happen in four years. But within eight, 10, 12, it doesn't matter when, it will happen. So that's an impossible goal, one. The second goal may be to overthrow the Communist Party of China. And this is, of course, hinted at and in the remarks made by Mike Pompeo, former Vice President Mike Pence. And is that the goal again? It won't work. The Communist Party of China is one of the strongest political parties in the world. It has achieved so much. And even the Harvard Kennedy School study has shown how support for the Communist Party of China has gone up from 86% in 2003 to 93% in 2016. And this is a very credible academic study that's documented this. And so if that's the goal, it also is not gonna happen. Maybe the third goal is to uh, contain China, like, like the United States successfully contained Soviet Union, cut off China's influence in the world. That too will fail. In fact, China today is more integrated into the global economy than the United States is. Now you can see that if these are the three potential goals of either the United States or the Biden administration or the previous Trump administration or the strategic thinkers of the United States, they cannot succeed. And so this is quite remarkable. United States is by far the most successful society we have seen in human history. Frankly, no other society has achieved as much as the United States has. Even to today, no other society has sent a man to the moon, right? United States has done it. It's a remarkable society. It has the best universities in the world, some of the best think tanks in the world, some of the leading minds in the world. But amazingly, this society has not been able to work out a coherent, credible strategy on how to deal with China. And let me mention in passing also that I, I, one reason why I say this uh, with confidence is that at a one-on-one -on -one lunch I had, Mr. C.H. Tong with your friend Henry Kissinger uh, in three years ago in 2018, he actually told me that the United States doesn't have a strategy. And that's why you notice, for me, actually, one of the leading indicators that we are now entering difficult times is the fact that Dr. Henry Kissinger, who's normally very cautious, <laughs> doesn't say very much. But for him to say publicly that, hey, are we on the verge of another World War I situation? Now, that's a very strong warning. That warning is an indicator 
that we are entering very difficult and dangerous waters in US and China. And that's why we need to speak out in Asia and explain that none of the things that the United States is doing with China today are working and they will not work. And, you, and look, for example, just let me just mention this, okay? What is the main instrument that the Trump administration used against China and which sadly is being carried on by the Biden administration? That's a trade war, right? They impose tariffs, sanctions on China. And, you know, I was at a panel recently uh, speaking at the Harvard Asia Conference, Harvard Asia Annual Conference, and that two very distinguished uh, Harvard professors were there. And when we were discussing this trade war and it hadn't worked, so I said, oh, what, then why doesn't the Biden administration just stop? Remove the trade and tariffs, right? And the answer given by a senior member of the Biden administration was that, hey, we cannot use the tariff, we cannot uh, re remove the tariffs because we need them as bargaining chips against China. And one Harvard professor very wisely said, well, that's like telling China that if you don't listen to me, I'll shoot myself in the foot again. <laughs> the trade tariffs have hurt American consumers, have hurt American workers, have hurt the American economy, and haven't damaged China. Right? So clearly, if, if the United States was a reasonable, logical uh, actor on the global stage, it would just get rid of this. Uh, tariffs and sanctions, but it's not possible to do so. And the fact that it's not possible to do so indicates how strong the anti-China sentiment has become in the American body politic. And so even that something that is by any Western standards of reasoning, that tar trade tariffs and sanctions should be removed, they cannot be removed because of the strong anti-China sentiment in the American body politic. So that's why, frankly, that is actually one of the most important reasons why we in Asia need to speak out because Biden is boxed in. Even though I'm sure privately he realizes, I'm sure he realizes it privately, that these actions against China don't make sense, right? But because the atmosphere in the U.S. is so toxic, he cannot afford to be, to be soft on China. And that's why we in Asia, and at the end of the day, I must emphasize the total population of Asia is what? 4 billion, uh, 4.5 billion people. We, we must speak out and explain to uh, President Biden that please at least press the pause button on the U.S.-China geopolitical contest. Step back. And then take a look at the overall strategic picture and see where you go from here. And this brings me to the second way, second point on how, second way on how we can help Biden. I think it's important for us when we speak to our American friends publicly or privately, we need to explain to them the nature of our times, you know. We are, the 21st century clearly is going to be very different from the 20th century and the 19th century, right? In what ways is it different? It's different in two ways. One, for the last 200 years, the West could dominate the world. Frankly, you know, if you, what year is this now? 2021, okay? That's reverse 160 years and go back to whatever it is, uh, 1841 and the Opium War, right? And I bring up the Opium War because that's how Hong Kong was created. And you could see that the Western powers could do anything with total impunity. They could do whatever they wanted, seize territories, colonize the world, do whatever they wanted to do and nothing could stop them. But that was 160 years ago, or 170 years ago, actually. That, that world is gone, right? It's not going to come back anymore. So that's why they need to adjust. 
and accept a new reality. And I say this because, you know, one of the most pathetic sights in my mind was when the G7 leaders met recently and started making pronouncements on saying, China, you must do A, China, you must do B, China, you must do C, excuse me. Who are these G7 countries? They represent the powers of the past. Their total population is what, 700, 750 million, right? Half of China's, same, uh, maybe the same as Southeast Asia. Why, why should they arrogate upon themselves the right to pass judgments? That era when the West could do that is gone and learn to live in a different era. And clearly what you're seeing now is the return of Asia. That's why the 21st century will be the Asian century. And within Asia, there's a very different dynamic that is taking place. And in the past, frankly, as I, when I grew up as a child in the British colony in Singapore, clearly I, I had to learn about the West because the West was running the world. Now the time has come for the West to learn and understand Asia because the key economic drivers will come from Asia. And it's time for the West to learn to adjust to Asia. And Asian norms are very, very different from Western norms. And, and you want a good example of this? You know, the Western countries will like to pass judgments on other countries and say your human rights standards are not good enough. You're making mistakes in A, B, C, D. And they could do that when they were very powerful. But the, but the, the times have 